Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Mani Kanuja, and I'm Senior AIML Specialist Solutions Architect at AWS. And today, I'm going to talk about how you can use Amazon SageMaker to help you accelerate innovation using machine learning. So if you look at uh, machine learning, so today, it's one of the key ways it's driving innovation in your organization. And some of the data points will be helpful to understand why there is this alignment between machine learning and innovation. So according to IDC, the global spend in enterprise AI ML, it really grew from almost nothing in 2013 to $50 billion in 2022 in just a span of seven years, which if you compare it with the cloud services, it's almost twice as much time as ML to grow to $15 billion business. So we are seeing that this investment is happening over the period, over the years, right? So, but why, why do we see this investment going on? Because it helps the businesses to address some of the important economic and social issues, which are varying from drug discovery, process improvement, sustainability, and so on. So although there are so many things that enterprises or the organizations are doing with machine learning, let's see how SageMaker can help with that. So Amazon SageMaker is a comprehensive machine learning service that basically enables different personas like business analysts, data scientists, and MLOps engineers to build, train, and deploy ML models for any use case regardless of their ML expertise. Customers do face challenges when they build and deploy the machine learning models. So there are four major challenges, as you can see on this slide. So first, there might not be enough people with the expertise to meet the growing demand for building machine learning models. So where SageMaker actually helps you provide with no code or low code machine learning tools, including SageMaker Canvas to enable the business analyst so that they can leverage machine learning without any ML expertise. Now we all know that data fuels machine learning, but the data needs to be labeled and prepared before it can actually be used for training those models. So the quality of that machine learning model is really dependent on the quality of the data. And this requires massive data processing capabilities. So for that, you can use SageMaker Ground Truth and SageMaker Data Wrangler, as well as SageMaker Processing Jobs that makes it easy to label and prepare data for machine learning. And also, uh, if we look at the industry uh, standards and tools that are provided for doing machine learning, there are so many different types of data science tools, which makes it really difficult to integrate uh, with, within one um, environment. So each of these are literally siloed by each part of the machine learning life cycle. So SageMaker helps you bring together these purpose-built tools for every step of your machine learning life cycle under the SageMaker Studio integrated development environment which really makes it easy for you to build and train and deploy your models. And also, once the models are trained, uh, you have to collaborate with DevOps team to manually manage this, these disparate environments for prototyping, development, testing, validation, and then move it, promoting it to, into production, which makes it really difficult to maintain consistency across these different types of environments, ultimately delaying the deployment of models to production. So for that, you can use the built-in MLOps capabilities, including SageMaker pipelines, SageMaker projects, and model registry to help you streamline your machine learning lifecycle. So this reduces the operational burden of managing ML models in production, and thus reduces the time to market. So let's take a deeper dive into, uh, into SageMaker uh, Studio and how it can help. So first of all, SageMaker provides an integrated 
development environment. It brings together a broad set of purpose-built purpose machine learning capabilities under a single pane of glass. So um, uh, Amazon SageMaker Studio is the first fully integrated development environment which is designed specifically for machine learning that brings everything you need for machine learning under one unified visual interface. So let's dive into the capabilities and benefits of SageMaker for building, training, and deploying the models. But before we do that, let's first understand how this SageMaker Integrated Development Environment, or the IDE, looks like. So Amazon SageMaker is really backed by a notebook environment. It's a Jupyter lab kind of an environment where you can do data processing, analytics, and machine learning, machine learning workflows in one unified notebook. So just like you can write many different documents from one word processing program from this universal notebook, you can access a wide range of data sources and write code for any transformation for a variety of data workloads. So it has built-in integration with Spark, Hive, and Presto running on Amazon EMR clusters and data lakes, which are running on S3 with the support for additional data sources coming up soon in 2022. So you can access and manipulate data without switching services. And you can also browse and query the data sources, explore the metadata schema, and start processing jobs uh, for analytics or your machine learning workflows. So you can code using your preferred framework to build, train, and deploy these models, all without leaving the universal Amazon SageMaker Notebook Studio environment. Now let's explore some of the capabilities for uh, processing your data. Let's start with the data processing. So when we talk about data processing, there are two types of data, structured and unstructured. Now the structured data is highly organized. It's quantitative data that is easily understood by machine learning. We do need to clean that data, of course, but however, structured data makes up only a small percentage of all the data which is out there. Unstructured data, on the other hand, is 80% of all the data. It's qualitative in nature and include things like images, handwritten nodes, and geospatial data, which is extremely valuable, but much harder to work in the context of machine learning. So we have spent a lot of time and energy to make sure that we have tools for all types of uh, data processing for our customers. So for, uh, so for structured data, you can use SageMaker Data Wrangler to easily aggregate and prepare the data for machine learning without writing any code. So with Data Wrangler, you can use a visual interface to access, cleans, and explore the data from a UI, from a single UI. Now with SageMaker Data Wrangler, you can select multiple sources. Currently we support uh, data sources such as S3, Redshift, Snowflake, and Amazon Athena. And you can import the data with a single click. Data Wrangler also have over 300 built-in transformations, which you can use to normalize, transform, combine the different features. Uh, for example, do one-hot encoding, convert the data types to a consistent format, and so on. You also have visualization templates using which you can quickly preview and inspect the transformations that you have completed and make sure that they are uh, completed as intended. Now with SageMaker Data Wrangler, uh, you can prepare structured data for machine learning, including model features, right? And then uh, you can store those features in the feature store. And we'll talk about that uh, later in our uh, presentation. Let's first focus on another tool. What if we have um, unstructured data? So how do we handle processing unstructured data? So for that, we have SageMaker processing job. It can be used for both structured and unstructured data. 
with processing, you can use a simplified managed experience on SageMaker to run your data processing workloads, such as feature engineering, data validation, model evaluation, and model interpretation. You can also use the SageMaker processing APIs during the experimentation phase and after the code is deployed in production to evaluate performance. And if you have large amount of data, it can also help you to perform distributed processing of data as well. You can also bring your own script for feature engineering and choose if you want to use built-in containers provided by Amazon SageMaker or bring your own containers. Currently, for processing, the built-in containers include sklearn, PySpark, and framework processors. A framework processor can run processing jobs with a specified machine learning framework, providing you with an Amazon SageMaker managed container for whichever machine learning framework you choose. So currently, it provides pre-made containers for Hugging Face, MXNet, PyTorch, TensorFlow, and XGBoost machine learning frameworks. And all the resources which are created as part of running the processing job are configured and terminated automatically. So you only pay for the amount of time that the processing job was run. So now let's see how would you configure and run the processing job. In this, we first need to create a processor object. In this example, we are using Escalon processor provided by Amazon SageMaker. In the first part, we define the necessary hardware resources on which the processing job will be executed. So let's first take a look at instance type and instance count parameters. So these parameters tells the processing job to launch one machine in the cloud of type MLM5 extra large in this case. If your instance count is greater than one, then it will automatically create a cluster for you. Next we need an environment on which our processing script will be executed. Since we are using sklearn processor, we define the framework version of sklearn needed for our job. In this case, after launching the instance, it will launch a sklearn container with framework 0.20.0. And now in the second part, we provide the processing script and the input location of our data. Your input data must be stored in an Amazon S3 bucket. Alternatively, you can also use Amazon Athena or Amazon Redshift as input sources. It will then automatically copy the data from S3 to the destination provide that you, pro that you have provided, to the destination path that you have provided, which is the path local to your container. Now, once the job completes, the output of the processing job is stored on an Amazon you specify. And if you don't provide the destination path in the processing output, then it will store it to the default S3 location. And all the cluster resources that are provisioned are for the duration of your job and are cleaned up when a job completes. So you only pay for the amount of time the job is running. So, so far, we have seen how you process your data using Data Wrangler and processing jobs. And we have learned that data processing is a time-consuming and a resource-intensive process. Due to the inherent nature of data being dirty and not ready for machine learning in its raw form. When I say dirty data, that means uh, missing or um, error values or outliers, etc. So how do we minimize the cost and the time spent on running the processing jobs over and over again? So what if there is a way to store the processed features in a central location such that they are consistent, discoverable, and shareable with other team members. Yes, I'm talking about having a feature store, which can be used for storing the processed features, which can then be used for training and inference on machine learning models. So there are certain challenges when we talk about storing our uh, features in a feature store. Right. So there is a, a separation which is needed between online and offline feature stores, and that can cause a feature drift, which can result in inaccurate predictions problem. 
So it requires like month of coding and deep expertise to keep these features consistent across training and development environments. And that can also lead to feature deduplication because multiple teams are working on similar features and they might uh, duplicate the same features, right? And which can ultimately slow down the model development and deployment. So how do we address this problem of using uh, you know, challenges that we talked about, feature store. We can do that by using Amazon SageMaker uh, feature store. So all features created in Amazon SageMaker Data Wrangler or using SageMaker processing job uh, can be stored in Amazon SageMaker feature store um, as long as the data is tabular in nature. So you can um, store those features with a single click and it's easy to update the existing features or even create the new features. So Feature Store actually serves the features uh, for in large batches for model training and it can also serve features with single digit millisecond latency for inference at runtime. Now, because SageMaker Feature Store offers a central repository for model features, you can have a consistent view of your features. In other words, the exact same features are available for training and inference. So your features never get out of sync between training and instance. And you can also visually search and discover features in SageMaker Studio. And all of your team members can share the features into the repository, promoting the reuse and eliminating a lot of rework. So SageMaker Feature Store comes in really handy when you uh, have when you need a unified set of feature definitions across different teams and share them. Now, so far we talked about processing our data and storing our process results um, in case of tabular data to the feature store. Now, the next is how do we build now once we have this data. How do we build the machine learning algorithms, right? So with SageMaker Studio, it provides you with all the tools that you need to iteratively try different modeling techniques in order to evaluate the performance. You can pick different algorithms. Uh, we have over 15 built-in algorithms that are optimized for SageMaker. And we have um, uh, 150 pre-built models from popular model zoos available with just a few clicks. And inside SageMaker Studio, you can run the models on a small scale to see the results, view the reports on their performance, and then you can come up with high quality working prototypes. Um, so it offers you a lot of capabilities, which I mentioned on this slide, like fully managed Jupyter notebooks, built-in algorithms, auto ML, and optimizations for all the big and large major frameworks that are used when it comes to building your models. So there are a lot. Uh, so Amazon SageMaker comes with a lot of pre-built algorithms. Uh, it provides um, high-performance, scalable uh, algorithms, which are actually optimized for speed, scale, and accuracy, and can perform training on petabyte scale of data. And as you can see on this slide, uh, the algorithms really range from uh, supervised algorithms like XGBoost, Linear Learner. Uh, image classification algorithms to unsupervised algorithms like k-means clustering, principal component analysis, and so on. So you can choose to use the built-in algorithms as well. I will repeat, they're highly optimized, scalable machine learning uh, op uh, algorithms, and are available out of the box for you to use. So once we have identified our algorithms, the next thing to do is basically train our models. Now, for when we talk about training our models, what do we really need? So that's um, how we have um, we came up with these different features that are listed on this slide. So a few things that I really need. So when, as a data scientist, if I'm working on a, on a model, I have selected, identified, OK, I'm going to use, let's say, for example, XGBoost model, right? a tree-based model, very simple model. And I'm solving a machine learning problem, uh, let's say a fraud detection problem. Now, what do I need in order to solve that? Of course, I need the data. I've already processed my data using the processing job. I've stored the features in the feature store because it was a tabular uh, data set. I've selected XGBoost as my algorithm. Let's, for simplicity, I'm using uh, SageMaker built-in algorithm, right? 
And what all things do I need? I need to optimize my model on my data. So I need to do hyperparameter optimization. Then I also need to experiment with different types of hyperparameters, right? And I need to keep track of those experiments. And then I also need to have transparency or visibility on how my model is training. So for example, uh, if I want to see whether it's overfitting or there's a variance or it's underfitting, I have to write additional code uh, to do that or uh, to do that, right? And I also want to see, like, because these training jobs are really, uh, will be running on some instance, so I want to also see how those machines or instances are being utilized. And then next, although I'm using NCBoost, but I have a huge data set. So how do I train my model faster? Uh, so some of these features are needed, like distributed training I, I would need to do. And for that, I have to write some custom script to do that. Then um, I also, uh, you know, and then when we are talking about training, distributed training and running different experiments, then how do I optimize on cost, right? So all of these um, uh, things comes into play when we talk about training the models. And based on that, we have all of these features which are listed in this slide. So let's start with the first one, which is experiment management and model tuning. So you can save weeks of effort by using uh, uh, automatic model tuning provided by SageMaker. You provide the range of the hyperparameters and uh, it will automatically select the best uh, hyperparameter based on the configuration that you have provided and the objective metric that you have provided. With debugger, rather than writing your own callback scripts to identify if uh, your model is overfitting or underfitting, I can just provide uh, different debugger rules. There are a lot of built-in rules. You can also configure custom rules for debugging. Uh, so I can do that and then select the action if the rule is triggered. So for example, if I enable the overfitting rule, then I can say, if that rule is triggered, stop my training job. So I can define my rule action and it will stop the job because I don't want to uh, you know, let the job running uh, and just to see at the end that it was overfitting, right? And then SageMaker also provides with distributed training. It makes it faster to perform it by automatically splitting the deep learning models and training data sets across GPU instances with just fewer lines of code. And additionally, there is a training compiler using which um, you can accelerate the training by up to 50%. And how does it do that? It will do it through graph and kernel level optimizations. That makes it more efficient to use your uh, GPUs. And it is integrated with versions of TensorFlow and PyTorch and SageMaker so that you can speed up training in these popular frameworks with minimal code changes. And uh, to, to help you optimize on the cost, um, you can use managed spot training and we'll do a deeper dive on the how managed spot training works. So these are some of the features provided by SageMaker for training your models. So let's see. What happens behind the scenes when we train our machine learning models? So let's take a deeper look. When we provide the training job, what goes in? So as you can see on the screen, I'm a data scientist. I have a training job. I go to SageMaker. I'm on the SageMaker control plane. I write this configuration code, which we'll zoom in into our next slide, right? Where I provide my estimator. My estimator will include um, the the framework version or the model that I want to use. And it will include configuration like number of training instances, which type of instances. If I want to use my custom script for training, then I specify that as well. So it has, in short, it has all the configuration related to it, related to triggering a training job. So when we provide that configuration, so what it will do? Uh, based on the number of instances, it will launch the machine learning instance. It, if I have provided a custom training script, it will copy that training code on that instance. And based on which framework I have opted, uh, it will have that container in, uh, launched on that instance. 
And it will also attach an EBS volume, which will basically attach to this um, uh, training instance, which I can use for storing the data. And then I also need to provide the input data for the training job. And there are three modes, uh, three storage uh, capabilities where you can provide. You can provide it on Amazon S3, or you can um, provide it on Amazon EFS. EFS is the Elastic File System, or FSx for Lustre. So you can provide either of these three uh, as your input data sources. And when you provide that, it will automatically copy the data locally to your instance, similar to what it does in processing job that we talked about earlier. And then it will run the training code. Once the training is done, it will store the model artifacts into the S3 location that you have provided. And you can also look at the logs and metrics in the CloudWatch. And once the training is done, it will terminate all the instances that were created so that you only pay for the amount of time the training is being done. Now let's zoom in into that code, um, which was there in the right uh, top corner. So in, the, uh, in my code, you can see that I, I can provide custom metric definitions. I can provide, I have to provide the inputs. In this example, we are, inputs are coming from S3 location. So I provide uh, the, uh, the S3 location of my training data as well as the S3 location of my test data. And then I provide, I would need to provide, I need to create an estimator. So with the estimator, there's a lot of configuration that goes into uh, picture. So in this example, I'm using TensorFlow. So I would provide TensorFlow. I would provide the framework version. So and I also need to provide uh, the number of instances and as well as the type of the instances. So when my training job will execute, it will launch those instances. It will also deploy TensorFlow container version 2.4.1. And then uh, entry point is the Python script, which is my custom training script. It will start that script. And it will also copy the data from the S3 location that I've provided locally to the container. And then it will run the training script and will tear down once the training is done. And you can see all those metrics, definitions that you have provided. These metrics can be seen on CloudWatch. So I need to provide the estimator and then um, with the estimator, I would do dot fit, and then it will start the job. And once the job is completed, as I mentioned earlier, it will tear down all of the uh, instances. Now, next is automatic model tuning. So with automatic model tuning, as I mentioned earlier, you only need to provide the range of hyperparameters, and it will automatically uh, tune your model. So there are certain things that you need to provide when it comes to hyperparameter optimization or automatic model tuning. One is I need to provide my hyper range of my hyperparameters. I need to provide my objective metric. So let's say my objective metric is loss. Then I also need to provide, I want to reduce, minimize the loss, right? So I would provide that configuration. And then I can also provide um, the number of uh, jobs that I want uh, the hyper uh, that I want the automatic model tuning to run. So uh, with all that configuration provided, uh, it will automatically tune the model and it eliminates uh, days or weeks of you know tedious manual work. So it comes in really handy um, when you are optimizing your models. Now, when we are talking about so many features within SageMaker training, right? Uh, training jobs are running. Um, all those jobs will run into a separate instance. You might use GPUs. With hyperparameter optimization, you will run so many different training jobs, which will run on you know, different machines uh, in the cloud. So you're basically, uh, there is a cost attached to it, even when you are uh, doing model tuning, because there's so many jobs that are running. right? So how do we optimize on cost? So let's see how SageMaker can help you do that. So for that, we can use managed spot training. So what does that managed spot training means? Uh, it sounds good. It looks that it saves up to 90% of uh, uh, cost on training, on model training. But how does it really work, right? And what does this managed spot training really mean? So think of spot as an unused capacity in the cloud. And managed spot training means that you can 
with this with this configuration you can uh, use the unused capacity for training your models let's see what it does behind the scenes all this flow chart it will do behind the scenes all you have to provide is a configuration that use uh, spot training and enable that flag and it will use only the unused um, capacity in the cloud we call it as spot instances right so it will trigger and launch the training job on spot only instances right uh, and since they are unused whenever the demand of these instances increases there can be interruption so how does that handle that let's uh, see in this slide so first we'll enable the manage spot training then it will launch the training with spot only instances and if there is a spot interruption meaning that unused capacity is no longer available then it will wait for the capacity right and then you also need to specify how much long are you willing to wait for that capacity so you provide the maximum wait time and you see that uh, if the maximum wait time is exceeded then it will terminate the job if it's not exceeded and the spot is available again uh, then <clears throat> Uh, it will also uh, see whether the checkpoint is enabled or not. If the checkpoint is enabled, then it will resume the training job where it left off. So for example, uh, you were using managed spot training and um, it already completed five hours of training and only two hours of training was left. So it will store all the uh, you know gradients and the weights uh, if you have enabled uh, the checkpoint. And then when the spot will become available again, then it will resume from that last checkpoint. So it will not start the training again, right? But this will happen only if you have enabled the checkpoint. So it's highly recommended. One of the best practices is to enable these checkpoints because if these checkpoints are not enabled, then it will restart the job. And again, the same process will continue and the training will uh, it will launch the training in the smart instances and it will uh, go like that. So some of the things that we have learned and some of the best practices on training is if you want to optimize on cost, uh, you can use managed spot training. But there are certain uh, things that you have to keep in mind. Uh, enable the checkpoint. You have to provide the maximum wait time and it's the unused capacity in the cloud. So there can be an interruption. But if you have enabled the checkpoint and it, uh, then it will resume from the last checkpoint. So you don't lose on the training time that you have already spent. Um, so this helps you in reducing the cost. But because this is happening behind the scenes, it might take a little longer for you to train the model. So now. Uh, we had talked about how we can optimize on cost. Let's take a look on debugger, which we touched based upon earlier, right? So uh, during my training, if there are any issues, how do I know about that? Uh, so it can, debugger can actually help you. So there are two things, right? Um, which debugger can take care of. One, my training job is running. And during my training, while the training job is running, if there are any issues like overfitting of the models or underfitting of the models, how do I get to know those when the training is happening and take and it should automatically take action? So debugger can help you with that. The second is that debugger is running on a machine. So how do I optimize the resources that is that are being used? Basically, I need to monitor and profile the system resources and I don't and I don't want to write any code, right? With code, you can do everything. But if you don't want to write uh, much code and quickly do that, the debugger can help you with that. So there are two things, right? One, detect bottlenecks and issues during training in real time and correct any problems to deploy the models faster. Secondly, to optimize the resources with no additional code. It can monitor the resources on which the job is running. So what these two things are really providing me it's making machine learning training transparent to me. So I get complete insights into my machine learning training process in real time and offline. So uh, debugger is uh, really helpful when you want to uh, make your machine learning transparent and optimize on the resources as well as on your training time. So now 
let's say uh, debugger is good because we can look into the transparency. But not what what happens if I have a you know huge amount of data, or when I'm running large uh, models uh, with SageMaker. So how do I optimize on those things? That's where distributed training comes into picture. Is the fastest and the easiest way to train la train large deep learning models. So with distributed training, there are two types of uh, distributed training. One is when I have large amount of data and I want to distribute the data, right? So we call it as distributed data parallel. Then what if I have large, huge model, which doesn't fit into one uh, single memory, then I want to uh, distribute my model and run it parallelly. So that what we call as distributed mo model parallel training. So SageMaker distributed training provides you with both the options. It reduces the training time. It's optimized for AWS. It can achieve near linear scaling efficiency with data parallelism designed for AWS. And you only need few lines of code to implement that. And it can reuse your existing APIs um, which you are using for popular machine learning frameworks such as Horoward or even your custom training code, right? So it can do all of that for you. Uh, it also um, automatically uh, partitioning your models. So for example, if you have a large model, it will automatically partition your model in an optimized way. So with distributed training comes really um, helpful. Uh, when you have large amount of data or when you have large model. So let's see how it works when it comes to data parallelism. So SageMaker does provide you uh, with the API that you can use uh, to perform faster distributed training and it will automatically split the data across um, different GPU instances with very few lines of code for the data parallelism. You can just write like four to five lines of code and implement that. So it supports popular APIs like Horoward and distributed data parallel for PyTorch. Um, and it provides you with near linear scaling. So you can use the SageMaker uh, data parallel training toolkit uh, to do that. And the second, as we talked about um, earlier, is the model parallelism library. So it makes it faster to perform distributed training by automatically splitting the deep learning models. Now this one is tricky because when it talks about distributing the deep learning models, meaning the models are too big to fit in one memory. So how do we do that? Just imagine if we have to do it uh, on our own, right? We first have to analyze the variables. We first have to analyze the graph structure. Then we have to see which subgraphs uh, uh, that I need to send to, de uh, to different devices, do all these partitions and all. So it's, it's kind of, it takes a lot of time, right? So with SageMaker model parallelism, it will automatically uh, analyze the variables, create a graph structure, distribute the subgraphs into different devices, with just as few as uh, 13, 10 to 13 lines of code. So it makes it really easy for you to run large models on SageMaker. So now, uh, so far, what we have talked about is we have talked about processing our data, training our models, and the different features that are provided by SageMaker. Now the time comes when we have to deploy these models um, to production for doing inference. So let's talk about the features provided by SageMaker for deploying the machine learning models. In, in the yellow on this slide, it's written fully managed deployment for inference at scale. So let's focus on what does this fully managed means. So as a fully managed service, SageMaker will take care of setting up and managing instances for inference ensuring software version compatibilities and patching all those versions. SageMaker also provides with built-in metrics and logs for endpoints that you can use to monitor and receive alerts. So that's what manage, fully managed really means, that you don't have to manage the underlying infrastructure, right? And then it provides different types of um, uh, inference. So for example, if you are looking for real-time inference, where you deploy the model as an API, 
where you need the response time with as low as few milliseconds. So it does provide support for that. And it supports use cases which require real-time responses, such as ad serving, fraud detection, and personalized product recommendations. Then there are use cases where you would need uh, to do the inference on large batches of data. Right, So we call it as batch inference, or you can some people call it as offline scoring. So we do have features for that where you can uh, do inference or on large uh, batch of data. So that we call as batch inference. And we also have support for near real-time inference in case when you have large models with long running processing times, um, then you can uh, use the features which are there for near real time uh, inference. We call it as asynchronous inference. And we'll talk about these different type of uh, inferences. And um, it's a it offers you with the cost effective deployment because you can deploy multiple models, uh, multiple containers with the endpoint. You can also use uh, serverless inference, which is a new capability added recently. Uh, in December 2020 at reInvent, and um, it will be it's available for preview for uh, right now, and will be in GA very soon. And uh, if you are so, for example, if we are talking about uh, real time inference, it also has features like A/B testing. So you, <clears throat> it also has features like A/B testing, so that you can switch over uh, the newer version of the model. And we'll talk about those. And then it has built-in integration for MLOps. We have talked about that a little bit earlier uh, when I was introducing about different SageMaker features. So you can do lineage tracking. You can um, uh, develop uh, machine learning workflows using SageMaker pipelines. So let's now go deep into and understand these different types of inferences. And I'll talk about some of those features which are there for each type of inferences, as well as we'll see a little bit of code snip for each of these features. So let's first start with real-time inference. So when do we need real-time inference? So real-time inference is needed when we have smaller payload and we want to get the response immediately. Right, And we want to deploy our models as an API so that they can be integrated by other applications. Right, So that's where the real-time inference comes into play. So what do I need for my real-time inference? Um, I would need to deploy the model uh, in a long-running machine where this model is deployed as an API. Right. So when you use real-time inference, your model is deployed on a uh, on a machine which is uh, run, which will keep running, right? Because we want our endpoint to be highly available. So we it also offers features such as auto scaling, where you can uh, you can configure your auto scaling policy, and based on the uh, load, it will automatically scale. Uh, when I say scale, it will basically automatically deploy your machine learning models to multiple machines based on the auto, um, auto scaling policy that you have configured, right? So that way it makes sure that your models are highly available, but you have to configure auto scaling policy. Second, what if my model is already deployed, it's running, uh, and then I have a newer version of the model that I want to deploy. But following the best practices, I don't want to switch my model to the newer model. So what I want to do is I want to do A-B testing. So the real-time inference provided by SageMaker supports A-B testing where you can have multiple versions of the same model deployed to the same endpoint and you can divide the traffic. So for example, you can say that I want 10% of the traffic to the newer model and the remaining traffic should go to my previous model. And I can slowly make that switch. So SageMaker offers A-B testing capabilities as well for the real-time inference. So now that we have understood some of these features of the real-time inference, now let's talk about how do we deploy the model uh, to, the, uh, to the SageMaker endpoint. So when it comes to deployment, you can have two, you can have two scenarios. One, you have trained your model on SageMaker. Second, 
you might have trained your model somewhere else and you want to deploy uh, it on the SageMaker endpoint and use all of these features that I just mentioned. So for that also, you can use real time, a SageMaker real time inference. So what we you need to, uh, as a prerequisite that you need to have is your trained model and you need to package your model in a model.tar.gz format and store that on S3 location. So now you have the S3 path of your uh, model, of your pre-trained model. So let's see how do we uh, then deploy the model. So in this particular example, I'm referring to TensorFlow model. So we'll import the TensorFlow model uh, op, uh, model uh, object, and then I'll provide the model data is equal to model path. What does that mean? The S3 location where my pre-trained model is stored. Then the framework version, which says I want to dip, uh, use TensorFlow version 2.3.1. And then I also need to provide an endpoint name. So in this case, I'm providing it and adding a timestamp to it. This is completely option if you don't want to add a timestamp. Um, so you provide the endpoint name. And now with that configuration, I would say deploy. So when I say deploy, then I need to tell that, uh, tell uh, SageMaker where to deploy. So I will provide the instance type on which I want to deploy the model. And also I want to uh, uh, tell SageMaker on how many instances to deploy. So then in this particular example, we are saying one. So it will deploy the model only on one instance. And note, it is saying initial instance count. That means that you can start with one and you can also update your endpoint and add more instances. So during uh, while it updates the endpoint, it still makes sure that your endpoint is highly available and still can make requests. So, so far we have talked about real-time inference. But what if you, you have a use case where you have infrequent on unpredictable traffic pattern? So during uh, times when there are no requests, then you don't want to deploy a model uh, on a long running uh, instance as in the case of real time. So that's where uh, you can use serverless inference. So when there are no requests, serverless inference scales your endpoint down to zero and help you minimize your cost. And how it will do is basically in three steps. So first, you will create your model. So you use the SageMaker Create Model API as shown over here, provide the configuration, such as the container image, uh, the model artifacts, uh, again, the S3 location where the pre-trained model is uh, stored and the environment variables. So once the model object is create, the sec created, the second step is to provide the endpoint configuration. On this endpoint configuration is where I'm going to provide the serverless config. So in the serverless config, you provide the memory size in MB and the maximum concurrency. Based on that, it will automatically select the right compute. And finally, you will do create endpoint where it will uh, deploy the model. Um, you provide the endpoint name and the endpoint configuration. So based on that, it will create the endpoint uh, that where the model is deployed and you can use that endpoint for making inference. So far, uh, we have discussed real time and serverless. Now let's talk about the scenario when we have to do inference on large batches of data. So in case when you have to do inference on large batches of data, then you can use batch inference. So for that, all you need to provide is where the S3 location of your model, provide which framework uh, version uh, of your model, uh, and then if you want to use custom script for doing the inference, then you can provide that script as your entry point. And then you provide uh, the batch inference um, instance count on how many instances do I want the batch job to run, the type of the instance on which I want to run the batch job. Um, and then uh, once you start uh, the inference using transformer.transform, it will take the data from the S3 location that you have specified and it will do the inference 
and will store the results back to uh, the S3 location that you specify in the output path. And it will then terminate all the resources that it has uh, launched uh, so that you are only paying for the amount of time the bad job was running. So the model in this case is not uh, deployed on a long running instance. It will be deployed only when the bad job is running and you're only paying for the amount of time the inference is happening. So that was for the batch inference. The next option is the near uh, real time. So in case when you have large models, uh, let's say you have um, some visual transformer model for image uh, uh, classification or object detection, and you have this large image size of 1 GB, uh, right? So for that, you can use async inference because we need uh, to do uh, because we need the results in near real time. So uh, what will happen? So this is more of a process flow. Uh, when you enable async, when you deploy the model as an async inference, what does what will happen? So a user will provide a payload to the async endpoint, and you can have multiple payloads. Uh, if the async endpoint is processing the payload, it maintains an internal queue. So your uh, request can keep coming in based on the internal queue. The endpoint will pick up the uh, pick up the uh, data. In this case, I'm talking about uh, images. So it will pick up the images. It will perform the inference, and it is a fully managed infrastructure where you can have your inference code. And once the inference is done, it will store the results in an S3 bucket. So that way, and you can also scale this infrastructure. And another important point to note over here is that you can scale the async um, endpoint from zero, uh, the minimum uh, from zero, so that when you are not using the async endpoint, you're not paying for it. So that's where this near real time async inference comes into play. I gave you an example for the image classification, but there are certain use cases like natural language processing, uh, also where you can use async inference. So, so, so far what we have talked about, we have looked into different uh, features of Amazon SageMaker. We talked about how we can process the data, use uh, the features for training our models, as well as deploying our models and the different types of inferences. So as a next step, what you can, how you can start with Amazon SageMaker. So there are certain links using which you can onboard and um, uh, you know start preparing your data and start with the data processing. So there are certain links on this slide, as well as I've, I'm providing you with certain links on uh, to get started with training your models. Uh, if you want to do distributed training or you want to use debugger. So some of those um, uh, links are very useful. And then I also have listed some of the links that are useful for deployment, which includes real-time endpoints, serverless endpoints, async inference, and batch transform. And then at the bottom, I have two endpoints, sorry, two links. <clears throat> One which has the Amazon SageMaker examples, that's a GitHub link, uh, which has a lot of examples um, on different uh, use cases as well. So uh, do take a look at that. And then um, the last link is the sagemaker.readthedocs.io link. It provides the SageMaker um, API definitions that comes in handy when you are actually using uh, SageMaker uh, APIs for different uh, use cases. So thank you so much for your time. Um, and it was a pleasure talking to you. And happy building and happy solving machine learning use cases using SageMaker. Thank you.